This is the fifth day of this November 2021 seven-day session, and I'm going to continue today uh, and read from uh, a couple of books by Charlotte and Joko Beck. Uh, We'll start with, again, the text we used yesterday and the day before, Every Day Zen, Love and Work. This is a section entitled The Razor's Edge. She says, We human beings all think there is something to accomplish, something to realize, some place we have to get to. There it is, laid right out in a nutshell. Uh, Human beings think there's something outside themselves that they have to get. That's what we work with in Sashin. Trying to come to see, to come to the realization that everything we need is here already. I think somebody said something, we are the change we seek. She goes on, and this very illusion, which is born out of having a human mind, is the problem. Life is actually a very simple matter. At any given moment in time, we hear, we see, we smell, we touch, we think. In other words, there is sensory input. We interpret that input and everything appears. It's a book written by, uh, why am I blocking on his name? Uh, He lectured here at the 50th anniversary. Anyway, it's entitled Coming, oh yeah, John Kabat-Zinn, entitled Coming to Our Senses. When we are embedded in life, there is simply seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and thinking. And I don't mean self-centered thinking. When we live this way, there is no problem. There couldn't be. We are just that. There is life, and we are embedded in it. We are not separate from life. We are, we just are what life is because we are being what life is. We hear, we think, we see, we smell, and so on. We are embedded in life and there is no problem. Life flows along. There is nothing to realize because when we are life itself, we have no questions about life. But that isn't the way our lives are And so we have plenty of questions. When we aren't into our personal mischief, life is a seamless whole in which we are so embedded that there is no problem. But we don't always feel embedded because, while life is just life, when it seems to threaten our personal viewpoint, we become upset and withdraw from it. For instance, something happens that we don't like, or somebody does something to us we don't like, or our partner isn't the way we like. There are a million things that can upset human beings. They are based on the fact that suddenly life isn't just life, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, thinking anymore. We have separated ourselves and broken the seamless whole because we feel threatened. Now life is over there. And I'm over here, thinking about it. I'm not embedded in it anymore. The painful event has happened over there, 
and I want to think about it over here so I can figure a way out of my suffering. <clears throat> it's always so poignant to see the shift happen in young children. They're so embedded in their lives. It's just amazing. Not that they don't cry and complain, but it's they're, they're all in. As they get older, begin to see themselves as a separate individual. It's a necessary stage, of course, in human development. But there's a sadness to it. <clears throat> Remember when my grandchild, <clears throat> Isabel at the time, we were at the table in Brooklyn and uh, pointed to mom and dad and themselves, said, Mommy, Daddy, Isabel. I thought, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Buckle in. <clears throat> she says, so now we have split life into two divisions, over here and over there. In the Bible, this is called being banished from the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is a life of unbroken simplicity. We all chance upon it now and then. Sometimes after Sashin, this simplicity is very obvious, and for a while we know what, that life is not a problem. <clears throat> you see that and you think, now I know. <laughs> it will never be a problem again. But in fact... <laughs> Karma, that's all I'm going to say. She says, most of the time we have an illusion that life over there is presenting us with a problem over here. The seamless unity is split or seems to be. And so we have a life harried by questions. Who am I? What is life? How can I fix it so I can feel better? <clears throat> Some of those questions can be very useful. Who am I? What is life? <clears throat> we seem surrounded by people and events that we must control and fix because we feel separate. When we begin to analyze life, think about it, fuss and worry about it, try to be one with it, we get into all sorts of artificial solutions when the fact of the matter is that from the very beginning there is nothing that needs to be solved. But we can't see this perfect unity because our separateness veils us from it. Our life is perfect. No one believes that. <clears throat> so there is life in which we truly are embedded since all that we are is thinking, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and we add on our self-centered thoughts about how it doesn't suit me. Then we no longer can be aware of our unity with life. We've added something, our personal reaction, and when we do that, anxiety and tension begin. <clears throat> and we do this about every five minutes. Not a pretty picture. <clears throat> Men reminded of the verses on the faith mind by Sung San, the great way is not difficult for those who do not pick and choose, <clears throat> or in other translations, those who have no preferences. <clears throat> we are the problem. So she says, now what do I mean by the razor's edge? What we have to do is join together these seemingly separate divisions of life, what we have to do to join together these seemingly separate divisions of life is to walk the razor's edge. Then they come together. But what is the razor's edge? <clears throat> Practice is about understanding the razor's edge and how to work with it. 
Always we have an illusion of being separate, which we have created. When we're threatened or when life doesn't please us, we start worrying, we start thinking about a possible solution. And without exception, there is no person who doesn't do this. We dislike being with life as it is because that can include suffering and that is not acceptable to us. Whether it's a serious illness or a minor criticism or being lonely or disappointed, that is not acceptable to us. We have no intention of putting up with that or of just being that if we can possibly avoid it. <clears throat> we want to fix the problem, solve it, get rid of it. That is when we need to understand the practice of walking the razor's edge. The point at which we need to understand it is whenever we begin to be upset, angry, irritated, resentful, jealous. <clears throat> That upset itself is a reminder. So we advance in practice. Instead of flying off the handle when something goes wrong, we come to our senses, we come back to this moment. We put our practice into practice. Feel it. <clears throat> Instead of thinking about it, instead of complaining about it. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. <clears throat> There's so much that we can't change, beginning with how things are. Right now, it's like this. That's our life. <clears throat> Everything we want is right there. If only we could see it. She goes on, first we need to know we're upset. Many people don't even know this when it happens. So step number one is be aware that upset is taking place. When we do zazen and begin to know our minds and our reactions, we begin to be aware that yes, we are upset. That's the first step, but it's not the razor's edge. We're still separate, but now we know it. <clears throat> How do we bring our separated life together? To walk the razor's edge is to do that. We have once again to be what we basically are which is seeing, touching, hearing, smelling. We have to experience whatever our life is right in this second. If we're upset, we have to experience being upset. If we're frightened, we have to experience being frightened. If we're jealous, we have to experience being jealous. And such experiencing is physical. It has nothing to do with the thoughts going on about the upset. <clears throat> it's in the body. Our practice, zazen, is done with the body. It's not mental machinations. <clears throat> and when we see, our realization is in the body. It's not cleverness. It's not a secret code to decrypt koans. <clears throat> she says, when we are experiencing non-verbally, we are walking the razor's edge. We are the present moment. When we walk the edge, the agonizing states of separateness are pulled together and we experience perhaps not happiness, but joy. What does she mean by joy? It's the freedom of not being attached. Even, even in grief, there can be a kind of joy. I don't know what the right word for it is. Maybe joy is not the right word. Maybe it is. We just are. It's human. It's natural.
my son died, was it nine years ago, nine or ten, remember how moving it was when people would say something, something kind. It was a lot of tears, of course, but there was something just so wonderful about it right through all the, the pain and the tears. <clears throat> She's not talking about a joy of flapping our wings and flying away to the land of rainbows and unicorns. But she's talking about freedom. Freedom of being who we are. She says, understanding the razor's edge, and not just understanding it, but doing it, is what Zen practice is. The reason it's difficult is that we don't want to do it. We know we don't want to do it. We want to escape from it. If I feel that I've been hurt by you, I want to stay with my thoughts about the hurt. I want to increase my separation. It feels good to be consumed by those fiery, self-righteous thoughts. By thinking, I try to avoid feeling the pain. Displace the pain. The more sophisticated my practice becomes, the more quickly I see this trap and return to experiencing the pain, the razor's edge. And where I might have stayed upset for two years, the upset shrinks to two months, two weeks, two minutes. Eventually I can experience an upset as it happens and stay right on the the razor's edge. is true we do advance as we practice over the years it's a change sometimes we don't notice the change Uh, sometimes people around us do but things resolve more quickly they don't stick as long the more we see that the more we're motivated to continue on this path path that never ends because as Joko points out somewhere else, there's always a point at which we can't just be with it. Everybody decompensates at some point and separates themselves. So we always have the motivation, the drive, the encourage of spur, the spur to do this work. And she says here, still I want to repeat It is necessary to acknowledge that most of the time we want nothing to do with that edge. We want to stay separate. We want the the sterile satisfaction of wallowing in, I am right. That's a poor satisfaction, of course, but still we will usually settle for a diminished life rather than experience life as it is when that seems painful and distasteful. One of the first things that happens in practice is we begin to see that it is diminished, that it's inadequate. It's not the life we want. Brings to mind the poem by T.S. Eliot, The Hollow Men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Later on in the poem, he says, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. That's our separation. All troublesome relationships at home and at work are born of the desire to stay separate. By this strategy, we hope to be a separate person who really exists, who is important. When we walk the razor's edge, we're not important. We're no self, embedded in life. This we fear 
even though life as no self is pure joy. Our fear drives us to stay over here in our lonely self-righteousness. The paradox, <clears throat> only in walking the razor's edge and experiencing the fear directly can we know what it is to have no fear. This practice advances. We get more of a feeling for this life of no self. Not as defensive. It's, it's easier to admit when we're wrong. It's wonderful not to have to defend yourself. <clears throat> Reminds me of Anthony DeMello's, I'm an ass, you're an ass. <laughs> Just a human being. <clears throat> we each have our karma. And we have more sympathy for others. They're in the same position. She says, now I realize we can't see this all at once or do it all at once. Sometimes we jump onto the razor's edge and then hop off like water dropped on a sizzling frying pan. That may be all we can do at first, and that's fine. But the more we practice, the more comfortable we become there. We find it's the only place where we are at peace. So many people come to the center and say, I want to be at peace. Yet there may be little understanding of how peace is to be found. Walking the razor's edge is it. No one wants to hear that. We want somebody who will take our fear away or promise us happiness. No one wants to hear the truth, and we won't hear it until we are ready to hear it. It's one of the reasons why teachers say the same thing over and over and over again. I remember reading Banke. <laughs> great book, but <clears throat> every other word is the unborn. Just hammer it home. On the razor's edge, embedded in life, there is no me and no you. This kind of practice benefits all sentient beings, and that, of course, is what Zen practice is about. My life and your life, growing in wisdom and compassion. So I want to encourage you to understand, difficult though it may be. First, we have to understand with the intellect. We must know intellectually what practice is. Then we need to develop through practice an acute awareness of when we are separating ourselves from our life. The knowing develops from the base of daily Zazen from many sashims, and from the effort to remain aware in all encounters from morning till night. Since we are most unwilling to know about the razor's edge, this wisdom is not going to be presented on a platter to us. We have to earn it. But if we are patient, our vision will become clearer, and then we will see the jewel of that life beginning to shine. Of course, the jewel is always shining, but it is invisible to those who do not know how to see. To see, we must walk the razor's edge. We protest, no, no, no way, forget it. It's a nice title for a book, but I don't want it in my life. <clears throat> is that true? I think not. Basically, we do want peace and joy. <clears throat> it's a little poem I came across by David White. It says, Enough. These few words are enough. If not these words, this breath. If not this breath, this sitting here, this opening to the life we have refused again and again until now.
<clears throat> this next section is entitled Enlightenment. Someone said to me a few days ago, you know, you never talk about enlightenment. Could you say something about it? The problem with talking about enlightenment is that our talk tends to create a picture of what it is, yet enlightenment is not a picture, <clears throat> but the shattering of all our pictures. And a shattered life isn't what we're hoping for. What does it mean to shatter our usual way of seeing our life? My ordinary experience of life is centered around myself. After all, I am experiencing these ongoing impressions. I can't have your experience of your life. I always have my own. And what inevitably happens is that I come to believe that there is an I central to my life since the experiences of my life seem to be centered around I. I see, I hear, I feel, I think, I have this opinion. We rarely question this I. Now in the enlightened state, there is no I. There is simply life itself. A pulsation of timeless energy whose very nature includes or is everything process of practice is to begin to see why we do not realize our true nature. It is always our exclusive identification with our own mind and body, the I. <clears throat> Ramana Maharshi says, just get rid of this self and this body. and the true self will shine. To realize our natural state of enlightenment, we must see this error and shatter it. The path of practice is deliberately to go against the ordinary self-absorbed way of life. <clears throat> and that's hard to do at first. I'm sure everyone has had the sensation of thinking, why do I have to do this hard practice? Look how happy the people in the bar are. <laughs> They're just absorbing happiness by the tankard. Sometimes in AA they'll tell somebody, well, maybe you need to go out <clears throat> and do some more experimentation. Some people, when they <clears throat> change the way they live, uh, sort of reinforce it with, with an internal commentary, a criticism of other people who haven't done what they've done. <clears throat> There's no one more un intolerant than the new convert. <clears throat> even though they themselves were in the bar just a week ago. The first stage of practice is to see that my life is totally centered around myself. Yes, I do have these self-centered opinions. I do have these self-centered thoughts. I do have these self-centered emotions. I, 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 I have these all from morning to night. Just this awareness is in itself a great step. Then the next stage, the next stage, and these stages may take years, is to observe what we do with all these thoughts, fantasies, and emotions, which usually is to cling to them, to cherish them, to believe them, to believe that we would be miserable and lost without them. Without that person, I will be lost. Unless this situation goes my way, I can't make it. If we require that life be a certain way, inevitably we suffer, since life is always the way it is, and not always fair, not always pleasant. <clears throat> Roshi Kaplow once gave a Taisho about man's justice and God's justice. God's justice is not always fair. <clears throat> There's no appeal. 
Life is not particularly the way we want it to be. It is just the way it is. And that need not prevent our enjoyment of it, our appreciation, and our gratitude. We're like baby birds sitting in their nest waiting for mommy and daddy to put food in their beaks. That's appropriate for baby birds, although mommy and daddy have more freedom flying around all day. We may think we don't envy the life of baby birds, but we do just what they do, expecting life to put its little goodies in our mouths. I want it my way. I want what I want. I want my girlfriend to be different. I want my mother to suit me. I want to live where I want to live. I want money or success or, or, or. We are like the baby birds except that we hide our greed and they don't. In a nature documentary film, a mama bear is shown bringing up her little ones. She teaches her cubs to hunt, to fish, to climb, to do what cubs need to learn for survival. Then one day she chases all of them up a tree. And then what does she do? Mama bear just leaves and doesn't even look back. How do the cubs feel about this? <laughs> they probably feel terrified but the path of freedom is to be terrified. We're all baby birds or baby bears, and we would like to find some piece of mama life to hang on to, preferably in 18 different ways, but at least in one. None of us wishes to hop out of our nest because that's terrifying, <clears throat> but the process of becoming fully independent or of experiencing that we already are that is to be terror over and over and over. So much of growing into our life, so much of learning how to practice is that willingness to do what we're afraid to do. And, and the more we do it, the more it becomes possible to do it. Sometimes it's helpful to just step back and say, what do I want? What's, what do I value? What's important to me? <clears throat> Anything of great value is going to require us to do what we don't want to do. <clears throat> and so we do it. First we do it and we're still grumbling. Eventually there's no need to even think about it. It's a koan, the sound of the bell. The world is vast and wide. Why do you put on your robe at the sound of the bell? <clears throat> we fight against being free, against the abandonment of our dream that eventually life will be exactly as we wish it, that it will shelter us. That's why practice can seem difficult. Zazen is to free us to live a soaring life, which in its freedom, its non-attachment, is the enlightened state, just being life itself. <clears throat> in the first years of practice, we do Zazen to understand our attachment process in its gross aspects, and then over the years, we practice with our more subtle and even more poisonous attachments. Practice is for a lifetime. <clears throat> could say that practice is for lifetimes. There is no end to it, but if we truly practice, we definitely realize our own freedom. A cub who has been away from mama for two or three months may not have the strength and skill of mama, but still it is doing well and probably enjoying more, enjoying life more than the little bear who has to trail mama everywhere she goes. <clears throat> probably enjoys both. Daily Zazen is essential, but because we are so stubborn, we usually need the pressure of long sitting to see our attachments. To sit along Sashin is a major blow to our hopes and dreams, the barriers to enlightenment. And to say that there is no hope is not at all pessimistic. There can be no hope because there is nothing but this very moment. When we hope, we are anxious because we get lost between where we are and where we hope to be. No hope, 
that is non-attachment, the enlightened state, is a life of settledness, you could say a life of equanimity. <clears throat> oh, she does, of equanimity, of genuine thought and emotion. It is the fruit of true practice, always beneficial to ourselves and to others, and worth the endless devotion and practice it entails. <clears throat> this moment now. Somebody asked the Dalai Lama, when was your happiest moment? And he reflected for a moment and he said, I think right now. <laughs> It's our wanting things to be different that creates the barrier. Meister Eckhart, the mystic who lived, I think, in Germany in the 1300s, I believe, somewhere there in the Middle Ages, said, And I say to you by the eternal truth that as long as you desire to fulfill the will of God and have any desire after eternity and God, so long are ye not truly poor. He alone hath true spiritual poverty who wills nothing, knows nothing, desires nothing. <clears throat> and St. John of the Cross said, In order to be all, do not desire to be anything. In order to know all, do not desire to know anything. In order to find the joy of all, do not desire to enjoy anything. Free, empty, embedded in life. This effort that we make in our zazen to unite with our practice, to drop the thoughts, <clears throat> to merge with the breath or the koan. That's what we're doing. <clears throat> There's a momentum as we try and fail, try and fail, get caught up in this or that, notice, come back again and again and again. <clears throat> the mind changes. The mind becomes cleaner. We feel some of the freedom that before we were only talking about. Already in this session, see this life, this freedom in people in the Doksan room. This is such an opportunity. <clears throat> Stop trying to protect ourselves. Give it our all. Steady. However it comes, gently, ferociously, patiently, <clears throat> looking in, turning the mind back. no more conducive place to this kind of practice than Sashin. And to do it with other people, to have the support <clears throat> of so many other people, both here in the Zendo, <clears throat> online, many, many people, about 50 of us, all swimming upstream, against our habitual tendency to sit in our silent pool, <clears throat> safe from the blows of the world. Opening, opening to this life. <clears throat> Our 
time is up. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.